In the last video series on aldol addition and condensation, we combined the nucleophilic reactivity of the enolate with the electrophilic reactivity of the carbonyl carbon. In this video series, we're going to return all the way back to nucleophilic acyl substitution of carbonyl compounds, specifically carboxylic acid derivatives. Recall that the hallmark of this class of compounds was the presence of a group, which I'm representing here as X, linked to the carbonyl carbon that has the potential to act as a leaving group. We saw a number of reactions in the original series on nucleophilic acyl substitution in which a nucleophile substituted for this X group. But one that we never explored and never even really talked about is the enolate as a nucleophile. Now that we've seen the nucleophilic reactivity of the enolate in glaring detail, we can ask the question, can an enolate engage in nucleophilic acyl substitution with, say, an ester or an acyl chloride or something else with a good leaving group attached to a carbonyl carbon. Generally speaking, the reaction mechanism here would involve a two-step process that amounts to substitution overall, a nucleophilic acyl substitution. First, nucleophilic addition to the polarized carbon-oxygen pi bond at the carbonyl carbon. And second, beta elimination of the X group as X minus to form the neutral product. In some cases, this works and in others, it doesn't. And so in this video series, we'll see the primary context in which it works, and it works very well, Claisen condensation. And we'll also explore what happens when we connect the carbonyl carbon to a carbon-carbon double or triple bond, in which case we end up with an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. These can undergo addition at the carbonyl carbon or the beta carbon, and additions to the beta carbon are called conjugate additions. You'll also hear these referred to as 1,4 additions, since the reactive atoms in this context tend to be the 1 and 4 atoms, the oxygen and the beta carbon, in the 4-atom pi system consisting of the carbonyl group and the carbon-carbon double bond. So let's begin by thinking about nucleophilic acyl substitution in which an enolate acts as the substituting nucleophile. Of course, in theory anyway, a neutral enol could also react as a nucleophile in this context, although examples involving enols are much more rare. And let's start with a hypothetical example. Given all the various nucleophiles that we've seen previously in substitutions at the carbonyl carbon and acyl group, it seems like enolates would be a great candidate for a nucleophile. This, after all, would result in the formation of a new carbon-carbon bond in the products and would give us a highly useful and functional product in which we have an alpha carbon between two carbonyl groups, a beta dicarbonyl compound. So for example, we could deprotonate and substitute here or do various things with the carbonyl groups to further elaborate this product. One approach to this that we might take is to first quantitatively generate the enolate through a proton transfer step with a very strong base like LDA. Deprotonation by LDA generates an enolate and I'll draw the resonance structure with negative charge on the alpha carbon since this is the one we're ultimately going to engage as the nucleophile. Once we've generated that enolate quantitatively, we could put it in the presence of a carboxylic acid derivative in which there's a good leaving group linked to the carbonyl carbon. And this X group would have to be more stable as an anion than the enolate that we see here in order for the overall substitution process to be thermodynamically favorable. Mechanistically though, the substitution occurs in two steps, just like all nucleophilic acyl substitutions. First, there's nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group. This generates a tetrahedral intermediate. Notice that the electrophilic carbonyl carbon is now tetrahedral. And to clarify where all the atoms are in this intermediate, let's highlight the electrophile in blue, including the X group and the R group attached to the electrophile and the nucleophile of this step in red, and this is the enolate with all of its various groups attached. In the product of this addition, the nucleophile portion of the intermediate bears an intact carbonyl group, while the electrophile portion bears the anionic oxygen, the X group, and the R group that was originally part of the carboxylic acid derivative. Within that electrophilic portion, we now have an alkoxide or an oxyanion and because that oxyanion is linked to a carbon bearing a good leaving group this can collapse in a beta elimination elementary step. 
And this is now for us at this point, the classic second step of the nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism. This gives us the neutral dicarbonyl product and expels X minus as a leaving group. So again, provided X minus is more stable than the enolate that appears right here, this overall mechanism of first proton transfer to generate the enolate quantitatively, followed by nucleophilic addition to the polarized CO pi bond and beta elimination to expel the leaving group and reestablish the carbonyl, looks like it should work beautifully. So let's now replace X with a concrete atom group to see how this works in practice. For example, let's look at an acyl chloride in which the atom that's ultimately going to serve as the leaving group or nucleophage is chlorine. This looks like it should work great because thermodynamically, right, on the other side of the mechanism that we just looked at, we're going to have the neutral beta dicarbonyl compound and a chloride anion, and Cl- is far more stable than the enolate that we have on the left-hand side here. So the favored side appears to be the product side, and thermodynamically, that's true. The issue is not that this is not thermodynamically favored. It certainly is. The problem is that kinetically, something else occurs instead that is also strongly thermodynamically favored. And the ultimate problem here is that we're asking in this reaction for the enolate to act as a nucleophile, a Lewis base, but it also has the ability to act as a Bronsted base, or what we might just call colloquially a base. In addition, the electrophile bears acidic alpha hydrogens. And we could make a very good argument based on the inductive withdrawing effect of this chlorine that that alpha carbon is much more acidic than the alpha carbon we're going to get when we transfer a proton to the alpha carbon of, say, our ketone enolate. Don't forget that enolates are strong Bronsted bases just as well as Lewis bases. This would give rise to the neutral ketone starting material, which is drawn up here and I won't redraw, and the conjugate base of the acyl chloride we're trying to use as the electrophile. Once we've generated this, we have an anionic carbon adjacent to a good leaving group, beta elimination becomes possible. We end up with an intermediate that might look a little bit exotic with a central carbon flanked by double bonds to O and C. This is called a ketene. And as strange as this looks, note that if we focus on the anion, if we focus on the charged species, in essence what we've done is just the same as our nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism. We've exchanged an enolate for Cl-. So this is a highly favored process if we just look at the anions involved. If we wanted to summarize what the problem here is, we can summarize it in one word. The problem is elimination. Elimination occurs in preference to substitution when we use acyl chlorides as the electrophile as well as anhydrides as the electrophile. And this seems to limit the scope of these acyl substitutions using enolates severely. After all, we need to generate an anion that is more stable than an enolate. We're running out of options quickly. If Cl- won't work and a carboxylate won't work, what does work? Well, we'll look at that in the next video. Our next step down the oxidation ladder, if you will, is an ester. And this reaction does work with certain types of esters.